Well, good morning. I do want to welcome you to the church. If you, didn't, if you don't know who I am, my name is Ryan. I am one of the pastors here. I did notice, I know we got an hour extra sleep, but for me, I stayed up an extra hour, and then my body wakes up the same time anyways. Well, uh, in 1935, the church in Germany was really struggling. They were not really sure what to do. See, there was just this satanic movement by Hitler that was just sweeping across the land. And they weren't sure, the churches weren't sure, do we support Hitler? Do we resist Hitler? And for us, it's a little bit easier because we can go back in time. We have 2020 hindsight and see everything that took place, but they were in the moment. And Hitler was doing a lot of good things for the German people. I mean, he revived the economy. After World War I, you know, they were, they were embarrassed that Germany was in shambles and he was bringing back even patriotism. Not to support Hitler almost felt unpatriotic. And so there were many churches who were beginning to compromise. They were beginning to fold. They began to swear their allegiance to the Fuhrer instead of Christ alone. But during this time, there were some pastors who were resisting. They were standing strong. They are saying we can only bow down to Jesus Christ in the cross, not to the Fuhrer or the swastika. And these pastors began to come together to support each other. They became known as the Confessing Church. Now, the leader of the Confessing Church, or at least one leader, was Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Maybe some of you know him or have heard of him. Pastor Bonhoeffer was standing strong. And what had happened is Bonhoeffer was being criticized on all fronts. See, we talk about the Confessing Church and the Compromising Church, but back then it was just the church. And there were many churches who were folding, who were just criticizing him, saying he's gone too extreme. He's just overboard on things. On the other hand, he was being attacked by the Nazis because he was resisting uh, the Nazi agenda. But what the confessing church began to do is they understood that there was such a bad movement that was taking place that they started a seminary. And they wanted to train young pastors to stand strong They understood the culture was very, very evil. And they wanted the seminary. The the main focus was knowing the word of God. It had to be foundational. It was a very intense seminary. It was very difficult. Bonhoeffer was the one who led it. Well, one of Bonhoeffer's friends started criticizing him. I mean, that hurt. He was struggling. This friend said, oh, yeah, I know Hitler might not be the best, but you've just gone a little bit overboard. So finally, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's friend visits him by the seminary. They used to row together. So they got into a rowboat, and there was a river right there, and they started to row on the river. They got to the other side of the bank. There on the other side of the bank, they could see the seminary, but they could also hear German warplanes going, taking off and coming back. And what, when they heard these German warplanes, because there was an airfield not too far from there, Dietrich Bonhoeffer looked at his friend and he said this. He, talking about Hitler, is building an army of harshness for war. I think about the formation of what we are doing in response to it. What are we doing as Christians in response to it? And then he looked at his friend and he said this. He looked at that little seminary And as he looked at that seminary, he said this. He says, this, talking about his seminary, must, must be stronger than that. Talking about Hitler's war machine. And what he was saying is that we must produce disciples of Jesus Christ who can stand stronger than the ungodly culture that comes against us. Today, I think most of us can feel that it just feels like there's this satanic movement that's just moving through our land. These are strange days, aren't they? We live in a strange land. The Hollywood elites, our institutions, education, social media, it seems like it's declared war on Christ and on Christianity and Christian values. And I wonder, I wonder, If Dietrich Bonhoeffer was standing right here preaching to us today, would he tell us this, talking about us, 
must be stronger than that out there. We must be stronger. We must make disciples of Jesus Christ who will not compromise. And it must stand stronger than that ungodly culture out there. Today, what I'd like to do is I'd just like to do a little mini-series on Daniel. Now, if there's someone in the Bible I really appreciate and like, it's Daniel. One of the reasons is this. Have you ever noticed when you read about Bible characters, most of them have serious flaws? But when you look at Daniel, he's just one of those few men you just don't see flaws about. And I think, how did he do it? How was he taken to a strange land? He understood what it felt like to be in a strange land. He was just a teenager. He's ripped from his family. He's taken to the most ungodly place there was, Babylon. And if we think America is bad, Babylon of that time makes America look like Mother Teresa. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible, evil place. And their goal was to assimilate Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah, into the way of the Babylonians. And I think, how did he stand so strong? How did he not compromise? And not only did he not compromise, and he didn't just survive, he thrived in that nation and made a difference for God in a pagan world. How did he do it? And so I'd like to look at that. But what I want to talk about today is how was Daniel so impacted? How was it this man, young man, a teenager, taken to Babylon, had such a strong foundation in his life that he didn't compromise? I think, who did this? Who helped build this foundation in him? And so today I'd like to look at a man that made a difference in Daniel and his three friends' life to help build that foundation in them so when they were taken to exile, they could stand strong. You know who that man was? It was King Josiah. King Josiah had a massive impact in these young boys' life. And so I'd like to look and think, what did he do? What did King Josiah, what was his life like, and how did he impact these others so much for Christ? So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Kings 22. 2 Kings 22. Now, it's always important for us to have context. Context matters. Now, if you remember, the last king over united Israel was Solomon. After Solomon, Israel breaks into two. Ten tribes to the north, known as Israel. Two tribes to the south, known as Judah. The The ten tribes to the north... By the time King Josiah comes on the scene, they've already been conquered. They were conquered in 722 B.C. So he's going to become the king of Judah. Now, being the king of Judah, they're independent, they're holding on, but the land has become more and more and more and more evil. Now, when we look at King Josiah's heritage, he does not come from a good heritage. His granddaddy... His grandfather, his papa, was Manasseh. Manasseh was one of the most ungodly kings ever. He was of Judah, and he only rivaled Ahab, who was a king of the north. Look at what the scripture says about Josiah's grandfather. He, talking about Manasseh, now listen, Manasseh reigned 55 years. That is a long time. So when you have such an ungodly for such a long time, it's devastating to a nation. If you think about, we change every four years. But if you go back 55 years, do you know who the president was? Lyndon B. Johnson. So this is how long this man reigned. Look what it says about King Manasseh. He sacrificed his own son in the fire. This would probably have been his oldest son. Practiced divination sought omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. He was an evil, evil king. So what we know about his grandfather is he practiced the occult. The scripture is very clear that God wants us to have nothing to do with the occult. But this man was inundated 
with the occult and occultish practices. But it also says this. He sacrificed his son to the fire, right? We know who that God was. That was the God Molech. So just to give you a little bit of understanding, this is a picture or like a rendition of what Molech would have looked like. It was a Canaanite Phoenician god. And it would have like the head of a bull. It was made of like, like a brass or a bronze so it could get really heated up. And what they would do is they would have ceremonies at night. And they would bring these drums and all these people, and it was like a demonic frenzy would go on. And they'd start beating these drums. And then what King Manasseh would have done is he would have taken his child, his oldest son, and during the night, he would have gone to Molech. Now, what the priests did at this time is they would start these fires in the belly of Molech. So there'd be a fire in there. And because it was bronze, the whole thing would just glow. Imagine the picture at night, what it would look like, especially with the frenzy and the drums beating. And then what they would do is they would take the child and they would put it in the outstretched arms of Moloch, the idol, the statue. Soon as the child would land on its hands, the child would be seared. And then by the time of Manasseh, they had counterweights. So they literally, the arms would raise like this and the child would roll into the stomach of Moloch where there was a fire and the child would be burned to death right there. Do you know the Romans witnessed this? And as bad as the Romans are, they said, there's nothing like this. It's that horrible. This is what King Manasseh did. He reigned 55 years. Now, Josiah's father comes on the scene. His name's Amnon. Amnon, the scripture says, was just as wicked. He was just as wicked as Manasseh. So it doesn't feel like there's a lot of hope in, in Judah right now, does there? After two years of being the king, Amnon was assassinated. Now, for us, just looking back at history, we think, oh, that's not that big of a deal. For Jewish culture, that was very uncommon. The Romans oftentimes assassinated emperors, but you do not see Hebrew kings being assassinated. But you can just show how evil and ungodly the land had become. That's his dad. Josiah is eight years old. Eight years old. And he's going to become the next king of Judah. Do you know an eight-year-old? That puts him in third grade. They're playing with matchbox cars, not running a nation. But King Josiah, at eight years old, is going to take the Lorraine. Look how the scripture starts. This is the story. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adai of Bosketh. Now, if you're just reading for the first time, you would not expect what's just going to happen. And he did what was right. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked it all the way up. Now, who does it say? He doesn't say Manasseh. He doesn't say Ammon. He goes all the way back to where that lineage started, King David. And he did, um, walked in all the way of David, his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. He stood strong. Do you know, I think this gives us hope. Because there are many of you who come from pretty difficult families. Many of you are embarrassed of your family and of things that have taken place. Maybe your grandfather was an alcoholic or your mom is a practicing witch. And you think, what about me? Do you realize even if our family is broken, we don't have to be broken. We can be like Josiah who says, I'm going a different way. I am going to follow God with my whole heart. I'm going to make all my decisions based on what he would want on me. And guess what? Even if you have a bum of family, you don't have to be that way. You can be like Josiah and make a difference. So what happens is, Josiah becomes now, we're going to fast forward, he's 26 years old. And he's going to look at the temple. 
He's going to say, it's in disarray. It's, it's been abandoned. It's falling apart. It needs renovation. And so he's going to hire construction workers to go to the temple and to rebuild or to, to renovate the temple. And so as he does that, he's going to call his secretary. His secretary is Shaphan. He's going to say, Shaphan, I want you to go to the high priest of Hilkiah. And I want you to make sure that Hilkai is paying the funds to these construction workers. Just make sure it's all taken care of. So Shaphan says, sure. He goes to the temple. He sees the high priests. He wants to make sure the construction workers have been paid. And look at what Hilkai says to Shaphan. And Hilkai, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. What? I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, and Hilkai gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. If he found it, what does that imply? It was lost. It was missing. Do you realize for the people there, they didn't even have the word of God anymore? And it isn't a crying shame that there are many churches that no longer is the word of God truly central or even really preached. And I think, how did this happen? How did a nation go from Moses delivering, going there to Sinai, getting the Ten Commandments, then you got Joshua, and you got these godly leaders. By the time of King Josiah, they don't even have the Word of God. And I think, how did Josiah even serve God? He's wanting to serve God, but he doesn't even have the Word of God. Now, we don't know this. We don't know if this is true. It's just speculation. But some scholars speculate that Manasseh tried to get rid of all the copies of the Word of God. He practiced the occult. And do you know how sometimes, let's say you're building a house, and maybe there's a wall, and I've known people, like, they'll put a, a Bible in the wall or a cross or something like that, saying this house is dedicated to God. Some people believe that the law was in the foundations there, and that's exactly what they did. So when they were renovating, that's the copy that they found. So he finds the Word of the Lord, He's now going to take it to Josiah. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkai the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. This is the first time Josiah hears the word of God. And you know what his response is? Look at this. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. That is a sign of great sorrow, great repentance, tremendous sadness. See, because when you read the book, the law, to the Jewish people, oftentimes God would say this, if you follow me wholeheartedly, I will bless you. But if you begin to serve other idols and you renounce me, the land is under a curse. And I will judge you. And so he realizes and he recognizes the land is under a curse. God's judgment is upon them. His grandfather served the idols. His dad served the idols. So Josiah is going to say, I need Hilkai, Shaphan. I need you to go inquire of the Lord. Tell me, where are we at? So Hilkai and Shaphan and some others, they go and they find a prophetess. And she is going to speak on God's behalf. And look what she shares to them. And she said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man, tell the man that, who sent you to me, I want you to tell this to King Josiah. You tell that man this, this is from God. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants. All the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, he's saying, I'm going to bring it. Disaster is upon us. Could you imagine just hearing that? Because, now let me tell you why. 
because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. At this time, they were serving the God of Baal. Do you know what Baal was? He was a fertility God. He was the God of prosperity. If we were to look at it in our day and age, it's like serving the God of the economy, making sure our portfolio is the best, making sure we're living for prosperity and happiness. At this time, they were serving the God known Ishtar. She was the God of sex. Sexual perversion had just gone through the land and swept through the land. They were also, and as you can see, Manasseh, they were serving the god Moloch. Moloch was the god that you would sacrifice your children for so that he would bless you and prosperity would come your way. The land was polluted. And oftentimes I wonder, does it not sound like America today? Is it not the same path that America is on? And I wonder too, if God is saying the same thing to us. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. Do you know what he's saying? Or she's saying? There's no hope. You cross the line. Judas crossed the line. God is bringing judgment, period, over, done. Drop the mic. But then, the next word matters so much. Do you know something? A big butt does matter. And it matters a lot. Because here, there's no hope. But then comes the but. But the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent, because you repented, and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, you repented before me. I, as God, saw that that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes. You just weren't acting it out. You're truly in your heart. This is what you meant. And you've torn your clothes and wept before me. I also heard you. Aren't you glad that God still hears his people? And he de declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. I am going to withhold judgment. And your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they brought back the word to the king. What he's saying is, yes, disaster is coming, but because you repented before me, I will hold back my judgment. I will hold back my judgment. But I was thinking, if I was King Josiah, what would you think? What, really, what would you think if you heard that? What part of you go like, oh, yes. Whew. No judgment on me. I'm going to see peace the rest of my life. Do you know Josiah doesn't have to do anything else? God already declared to Josiah that because of the way he reacted and responded, he's not going to bring judgment. Josiah doesn't have to do anything else. All he'd have to do is eat, drink, be merry, just live life, have a good time, because guess what? For me, life is good. But that's not what he does. And you're going to see what King Josiah does after this. There are two actions you'll see in the next chapter. The first thing Josiah does, remember, the people do not know the word of God. He reads the word of God to all the people. Isn't that amazing? He is going to make the word of God central in his life and in Israel's life or Judah's life again. 
And so what, they do, what he does is he says, I want all the people of Jerusalem to gather them, gather them, get them here, and I am going to read them the word of God. Do you know who would have been present there? Even though it doesn't say by implication, you know who was there? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and here they begin to see a godly king stand for the word of God, and they witnessed it. And they began to learn the word of God. It was being restored once again to the land. But the next thing that Josiah does is extremely risky. What happened to Josiah's dad? He was assassinated, right? The point is this. You cross the wrong people, and your life is on the line. And the whole land is polluted. He doesn't care. He's going to, in his fence, cross the wrong people. And the second thing he does is he removes the idols from the land. And he goes on a rampage. He goes into the temple because the temple has idols in it at this time. He says, get rid of them, destroy them. He goes into Jerusalem and he says, I want all the idols destroyed. I don't care who's upset. I don't care who's offended. I don't care who's mad at me. We are going to cleanse this land. Then he goes into Judah. He, he is so thorough. Do you know what he does? He says, dig up the bones of the priests. Dig up the bones of the priests who've led Israel astray. Dig them up right now. Dig them up. They dug up the bones, and then they burned them. It was a way of desecrating those bones. That's how thorough he was. And what happened is this man brought back the word of God and lived by conviction. And there were boys who were watching him. Daniel saw what he did. Hananiah saw what he did. And he saw, they saw for the first time a true man of God in leadership, standing strong on the word, not compromising, living by conviction, standing strong. When I look at this story, I realize there are so many parallels to Josiah's day and to the day that we live in. I think most of us would agree, as a nation, we have rejected God. Our land is polluted. It is evil, and it is a sick land. Nowadays, what God calls good, our culture calls evil, doesn't it? And the very thing that God says, that's evil. Do you know what our culture does? It doesn't even call it good. It celebrates it. But do you know, we stand at such a time as this. And we must truly become disciples of Jesus Christ. I believe as the pressure of our culture bears down on us, the ones who are posers are going to be exposed. And I think, what do we do? What do we do at such a time as this? You know, I think about our speaker, what he said last week. He said this, we are capable, we're not ready. We are capable, but we're not ready. Do you know what we must do? We must become ready. Just as Dietrich Bonhoeffer realized that there was a war at this time being waged against the church, that he must now prepare another set of pastors, another generation against this evil. We've got to do the same. Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah, they were impacted by the conviction of a godly man who stood on the word of God. Scripture does not say this. I do not know. But we believe that Daniel was a teenager when he was taken captive. So let's say he was 16 years old. I wonder if Daniel said this. If King Josiah, eight years old, could make a difference and stand strong, I can do it at 16. I will stand strong. See, we must, while we still have the time, this window of opportunity, invest our lives in other people. And we cannot fail the mandate. We have to follow the example of King Josiah. The first thing we must do 
is we must develop sound theology, not soundbite theology. We must, we must develop sound theology, not soundbite theology. Do you know what soundbite theology is? It's just knowing a little bit of God's word here, a little bit about God's here, and think we know God's word, but we don't. We don't know it in context. Do you realize when Satan tempted Jesus, do you know how he tempted him? With the word. What Satan does, he always takes the word, but twists the word just enough so that we think we're actually hearing the word, but we're living by a sign about theology, which really comes from the pit of hell. Do you know Jesus was able to resist it? He was not fooled by the lie. Do you know Satan is no fool today? He is not going to come against the church, most likely, in a full-out lie. The reason is we'll probably detect that and reject that. But you know what he does? He takes just enough of the word and begins to twist it so that we think we know the word, we're living the word, but it actually comes straight from the pit of hell. Let me give you some examples. Have you heard this? I'm sure your culture, I mean, we've all heard it. Don't judge. Do you know that is soundbite theology? Don't judge, soundbite theology. That is taken out of context. Do you know Paul, the apostle Paul himself says, I judge all things. So what is it? But what happens, we twist things, we twist the word, we think we know the word, and then we are taken by it. Here's another. God is love. So just love. That sound by theology. It is sound by theology. Is it true God is love? Yes or no? Absolutely. But do you know there is a difference between biblical love and worldly love? And we confuse the two. To love someone in a biblical way is for us to sacrifice ourselves for them so that they become more like Jesus Christ. That's biblical love. We sacrifice ourselves for another that they might become more like Jesus Christ. But we're taught in the world That love means you endorse sin. So if you don't endorse sin, you don't love, and God is love. That's not godly love. That's worldly love. Soundbite theology. Do you know Jesus, who is love, for he is God, never endorsed sin? See, what happens is this. We oftentimes, as a people of God, go to extremes. On one extreme, we have all the truth in the world. Truth, 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 I know the truth, but we have no grace. And truth without grace is mean. Have you ever been around mean Christians? They got all the answers in the world, but they have no grace of God, and they're just mean people. But you know what the other extreme is? We can have all the grace in the world with no truth, and therefore we become meaningless. We can literally love a person straight to hell and make no difference because we never spoke truth. The second thing is that we must choose Christ over comfort. We have to choose Christ over comfort. Josiah could have lived a comfortable life. Ah, disaster's not coming my way, but he didn't choose that direction He chose God's way. He destroyed the idols. He brought revival to his life. And he brought revival to the land. Do you know where the cross was won? Do you ever think about that? Where was the cross won? The cross was on in the garden. And there at the garden is when Jesus said this. I choose the way of sacrifice, not the way of comfort. When he said this, Not my will be done, but thy will be done. If we become a people of sound theology and we begin to choose Christ over comfort, we will not only impact our lives, we will impact lives around us and generations to come who will be able to stand when the trials are even tougher Josiah had an impact on Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah's life. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, 
He pointed to his little seminary. He pointed to that little seminary. And he said, this must be stronger than Hitler's war machine. Do you know Bonhoeffer was sentenced to the concentration camps? Eventually, he stood before an SS judge. Without witnesses or evidence, he was sentenced to the gallows. And on April 9th, 1945, the Nazis stripped him naked. They led him to the gallows. They placed a noose around his neck, and they hung him. There was a doctor who witnessed the execution. Listen to what this doctor said. I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer kneeling on the floor, praying fervently to God. I was most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of execution, he again said a short prayer, then climbed the few steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensued after a few seconds. In almost 50 years that I worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. And you know, at that moment, I believe if we looked at that moment in time, we would have thought Bonhoeffer lost. But he didn't lose. Bonhoeffer won. Do you realize with the passing of time, Adolf Hitler committed suicide? The Third Reich is dead, and even now Germany still feels the shame of the atrocities it committed in World War II. But Bonhoeffer is still impacting lives for Jesus Christ this very day. His books are still affecting people today. And although his seminary didn't look like much, he was right. What he did at that school was stronger than Hitler. It was stronger than the Third Reich, and it was stronger than Satan's war machine. Let you and I, while we still have this time, be committed to be like King Josiah, to be like the Bonhoeffers of the world. We must, we must, we've got to know God's word. We've got to know his word. We have to study his word. That's why I encourage you, come to BAC 90. We'll get into it a little bit deeper. Or... Pastor Luke is putting equip classes together. They're not ready, but when they are, I encourage you to come or listen to them. Why? So you know the word. We right now have a little calendar that has a reading plan. Read the word daily. But we've got to be a people that are committed to the word of God. And after we make that commitment, the second thing is we don't just learn the word. We live the word. We have to live the word of God. Will you commit to be like that type of person today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, for such a time as this, and Lord, when we look around, it certainly seems like our land is so polluted, so evil. But God, I pray that we will truly be like King Josiah. I actually pray we'd be like Daniel. They didn't retreat. They didn't retreat at all. But they stood They did not compromise. And I think about how Daniel witnessed to the greatest king of the time about you. He impacted. He impacted an ungodly culture. He didn't retreat, but he stood strong on the word of God in conviction. And Lord, while we still have that opportunity today, I pray that we would study and learn your word. And not only learn it, but truly live it. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.